Thank you for joining us on the panel discussion on the future of the global economy. I'm Yumiko Ono, and I'm an editor for the Wall Street Journal based in Singapore. It's so good to have so many people from all over the world today. This webinar is part of INSEAD's lifelong learning series. It's primarily targeted at the global alumni community, but for topics of general interest like this one, it's also open to the public. So I wanna thank the school for inviting us to participate. It's an extremely timely topic that we have today. And there's so much ground to cover in the next 60 minutes. The world is full of uncertainties right now. There's been two plus years of COVID, another month of war in Ukraine, the highest inflation in 40 years, and China is putting its economy at risk with strict zero COVID policies. So how would all of this impact the global economy? I want to introduce the panelists for this discussion. We have Ilyan Mihov, who has been the Dean of INSEAD since 2013, based in Singapore. Ilyan joined INSEAD in 1996, and his expertise is in macroeconomics with a focus on monetary policy, fiscal policy, and economic growth. We have Lily Fan, Professor of Finance at INSEAD, Lily joined NCIAD in Asia campus in 2003, and she's now the Dean of Research based in the Europe campus. Her primary research is on financial market information and investment strategies. And from the Wall Street Journal, we have Jason Douglas, a reporter based in Singapore. He covers economics in Asia with a big focus on China. And he joined Dow Jones in 2007 in London and covered economics and policy in the UK and Europe. So let's dive into the questions for the panel discussion. We will start with a topic that a lot of questions have come in about, and this is about China. But first of all, actually, I'd like to each uh, ask each panelist to provide a quick personal anecdote about something that made an impression on you about all the uncertainties in the global economy right now. And I'll start with myself. For me, I cannot believe that the yen is at a 20 year low. Now my daughter is almost 16 and she just got her birthday money from her grandparents in Tokyo and she got 10,000 yen. So if she wants to buy something on Amazon, a year ago, that would have been $93. But right now it's closer to $75. We also have a question about this from the audience. So we might get to that later. So Ilian, I'd like to start with you. What is something that's made a mark on you about the global economy? I don't know exactly how to put it, but first of all, thank you very much for having me on this panel. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about macroeconomics rather than other things that I've been talking about in the last 10 years as the Dean of Institute and before the Dean of Faculty. So what has surprised me in the last, uh, in, the recent, uh, in the recent past, I would say I cannot believe the behavior of the Fed. I just, I cannot. I cannot believe that the real interest rate today is minus 7%, which is the nominal rate minus inflation. And they have been sustaining this for such a long time. I mean, as somebody who started monetary policy, I had never seen anything like this before in the post-war history of the United States. So that's, to me, pretty surprising. Okay, we'll get to a plenty of questions about the Fed a little bit later on. Uh, Lily, I want to turn to you. What's been a surprise for you about the global economy? Well, actually, a personal anecdote, I mean, as I'm living in Europe nowadays, you know, the, the fuel price when I go to the gas station is just absolutely compared to, say, let's say, two months ago, it's up 40%. So, wow, you know, it's, um, it's unbelievable. I mean, this is related. I can echo what Ilian is saying. It's just the, um, the Fed has been running a very uh, loose monetary policy for, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Jason, what about you? Right, well, you mentioned the uncertainty in the global economy. I've, uh, my family and I moved to Singapore uh, only a couple of months ago when pretty uncertain where all our stuff is. It's floating somewhere in a <laughs> container, we think, and uh, the Indian Ocean possibly. We're not exactly sure when we're about to meet it. So I think we've come ensnared in the global supply chain snarl up somehow. Oh dear, okay, I hope your stuff gets to you soon. Okay, well, thank you everyone. 
So let's start the discussion on China. And the question is, can China reverse its economic slowdown while still maintaining a zero COVID policy? We've had lots of questions on this. And as you know, China just had uh, announced weak trade data. It's gotten uh, bad manufacturing and service data recently. So Ilian, I wanna start with you. How do you see what's going on in the Chinese economy right now? Uh, it's a bit intimidating to speak here when Jason is on the panel, you know, he's the expert on China. Uh, but you know, in China in general, there are several forces affecting the economy uh, right now. Uh, I think that uh, obviously the strict COVID policy is one of them. And uh, I don't think it will be possible to reverse the slowdown with this COVID policy, but the COVID policy itself is easy to reverse. So I don't think this is a major, uh, a major rock, uh, roadblock for the Chinese economy. The second thing is obviously um, all this crackdown on certain groups and uh, the intervention in the financial sector and so on. And I think that that creates a lot of uncertainty that will be definitely reducing the growth of the country um, in the long term. And the third thing, which I have been talking a lot about in my lectures, is that China is now in um, the area which is middle income. And in the middle income area, there is something called the trap. Uh, which I used to call the, the wall, um, which basically says that uh, countries that lack uh, good governance and good institutions cannot continue growing and become your know, rich countries. At least historically, that hasn't happened. So, I mean, I know maybe China might be different, of course, but that hasn't, I mean, there are countries that have grown rapidly, reaching $15,000, $20,000 income per capita, but today, if you look at a scatter plot of quality of institutions and income per capita, there is not a single country that has poor quality institutions and high income per capita. So that's a, that's a more fundamental force that uh, I think that might be now impeding growth as well. Okay, so some longer term um, issues at play as well. Uh, Jason, I want to go to you. Economists have started talking about a recession in China. You'll have to explain this because um, the IMF is forecasting 4.4% growth. And how could there be a recession with that much growth? But can you describe what, what that means? You've written a story about this recently. So tell us about that as well. Sure. So, I mean, recession is not a word you hear very much in economic commentary around China, but it is, interestingly enough, starting to creep in quite a lot now. I think economists mean a few different things when they use the word. I think in the very short term, there's a pretty high risk of a contraction in the second quarter, given all the lockdowns and the other problems of the economy that Ilian mentioned. Um, whether or not that will be extended into the third quarter, which would then give you the give you a technical recession, so two straight quarters of consecutive contraction, is probably a little bit unlikely. But what people do talk about, and I think quite persuasively, is this idea that China is in a growth recession, that uh, growth in China is nowhere near potential, that it's not creating enough jobs. And we're starting to see that play out in the labor market, unfortunately. Um, and with all the headwinds that the economy is facing, it's kind of difficult to see how it, how it overcomes this. Just one question, just one point on your previous question, uh, Yumiko. I think the important thing is, you know, the stimulus policies that they want to use probably won't work as long as you have zero COVID, right? I mean, if you want to build, if you want to do a load of construction projects, you need workers to be able to get to the construction sites, you need, um, you know, logistics to work to transport the things there. And these are all the things that have been um, stopped or snarled up uh, by the zero, zero COVID policy. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of headwinds for Chinese growth this year, for sure. So what you're saying is that the Chinese government will no doubt try to do many things as much as it can to boost the economy. But a lot of things, because they're taking the zero COVID policy, it may not work so well. Is that it? I think that's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the, the old expression from monetary policy is pushing on a string, right? And we're seeing that already. I think we're going to get to the People's Bank in a moment or two. But you, you, you know, there's no appetite for loans. Consumers are all locked up at home. They can't spend any money. Um, and how are you going to get a, how are you going to get an infrastructure boom going if it's hard to move things around and get people to the building sites? 
um, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it just it's it, it seems very difficult. Yeah. Would you agree that to other economists saying that China is in or will is heading into a recession? I mean, again, I think Jason is right that it's probably the the growth recession kind of uh, the below potential growth is uh, more accurate. Um, I, to me, it depends how long they can they go with this zero COVID policy, and of course, you know, if they continue for a year or so. I will not be surprised if they end up in a recession. So the question is not so much, will it happen? The question is, will we have a zero COVID policy for more than a year? It's, uh... Okay, okay. Um, Lily, question for you. What indicators should investors be looking out for? You know, what is a realistic outlook for China and what should investors be on the lookout for going forward? Right. So, you know, I very much agree with what Ilian and Jason said, you know, in the in the short, the very short run, I think China is going to hobble along. They might have single digit, low single digit growth. But, you know, in Chinese uh, economy for the size of its population, uh, it actually needed higher. It's not that a po any positive growth rate is is sufficient. You know, anything I think a while back, you know, due to the population growth, and the poverty that still exists in some part of the country, the country actually needed something like an 8% to, to in fact, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of be, be uh, truly growing. So 4.5%, even though it's positive, is actually not enough kind of a growth. I think in the short run, obviously we're gonna watch for the case numbers and watch for any policy indication of whether they are going to want to back down from the zero COVID policy because that's just contradictory to, like Jason said, you know, to kind of uh, uh, implementing even the fiscal policies that they want to do. And, and by the way, then this is, there's a difference between what we want to look for in the short term versus long term. In the short term, we want to watch for this COVID policy and how long this is going to last. And in the long run, I think that, you know, exactly uh, what's being highlighted is that China always continues to rely on fiscal stimulus. And it's, it shows the structural problem of the economy. You know, for the country to escape that sort of middle income trap, what you really needed to develop is private enterprises, is consumption-based, you know, consumption-driven economy. And I don't think that the Chinese current government is really, you know, kind of going in that way, just in terms of the policy that they're taking towards, say, technology industries and so on and so forth. And they very much want to put the economy under you know, a central, uh, centrally driven fiscal investment driven thing. And that just is the Chinese old habit of doing it in this particular way. And that leads to you know, debt issues and problems like that. So I think you know, in the short term, it's a COVID thing. And uh, the, in the long term, we should be looking for things like what is the consumption demand? What's the private sector development and um, productivity growth and producer indexes and you know, things like this that shows live for the private sector rather than the central, you know, centrally, uh, centrally driven economy. So the government has said that they want to spend a lot more on infrastructure, but what you're saying, Lily, is that that is not going to work to That's boost the economy. That's something they have always reverted back to when they mm -hmm. have, you can always kind of drive a particular number of GDP growth, but it's a very poor quality growth, you know, mm -hmm. It, mm -hmm. it may not be where you needed to invest and, and it creates many economic imbalances and also you know perhaps oversupply of certain capital goods and even environmental you know damages and so forth so this is this is what the playbook they've been playing you know using very effectively in the last say 30 years but going forward i think you know echoing what ilian said they needed a new development model and that might need you know a, a you know a, a improved governance model too so should they be using the money to boost consumer spending, for instance? That I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what the U.S., the Federal Reserve and the U.S., you know, uh, they have done that. I'm not sure that uh, that's necessarily the case, but I think that, you know, kind of emphasizing private uh, sector development, that's an important aspect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Jason, what would be a much weaker Chinese economy or even a recession mean for the rest of the world? Which geographic area would be impacted the most? Yeah, sure. I think, um, I don't think it would be, uh, I've been thinking about this quite a bit recently. There's a kind of double whammy effect, right? So China is increasingly 
um, a very important source of demand in its own right. It's a big economy. It's, it was 18% of GDP last year or something like that. That's, that was bigger than the EU. Um, it is also right in the center of all these global supply chains. So you have this, this double whammy effect. You have countries that'll be hit by um, slowdown in Chinese demand, countries that'll be hit by um, the disruption to supply chains and countries that'll get both. And uh, in terms of where looks most vulnerable um, to me and to the economists I speak to, we have to look to Asia, to um, China's near neighbors who are really tied in tightly to those supply chains. Uh, we're already seeing exports rolling over in places like Taiwan and South Korea and even Japan. Uh, you looked at German industrial production data last week, that was terrible. That was down on the month, the biggest fall since uh, I think the pandemic uh, began. Um, one place that is, so I think Europe probably has a bit of a problem. And one place that is actually, I think, kind of insulated, uh, at least from the demand side, is the United States. Um, but then, of course, you have the issues on the supply side um, and the risk of these further supply chain disruptions that were such a problem for uh, U.S. consumers last year. We got a very timely question from the audience, so I want to slip this in. Ilian, this is for you. So if China goes into recession, how much would it contribute to the world economy going into recession? I mean, as uh, Jason was saying, China is already about 18% uh, of GDP and uh, it's uh, so that definitely that will be the direct effect of, uh, of on the world, but the indirect effect, which will be dragging the other countries that are linked to China, is probably also be significant. So if the, these other countries, especially here in Southeast Asia, they're so dependent on China, so linked to China in terms of trade, all of them will start experiencing slowdowns. Now, uh, will that generate a worldwide recession? Uh, remains still to be seen. I mean, it depends what the, the US and the EU are doing. They're still pretty big economies. And uh, you know, if they manage somehow to maneuver out of the current situation, then it doesn't have to be a global recession, but definitely the impact will be significant and the growth will slow down. So it really would depend on what the US and Europe do? Or... Yeah, I mean, the, there's, there's still, you know, each one of them is about 15, uh, 16 percent of the world economy. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, you know, it depends how you calculate. Whether you calculate in purchasing power parity numbers or in current exchange rates. In current exchange rates, they're even bigger than that. So mm -hmm. I would not, uh, you know, it might. And of course, we measure recessions in current exchange rates, not in PPP usually. So it. It, it will definitely lead to a slowdown, but it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be a certain recession if monetary fiscal policy in Europe and the US respond properly. And I wanna stay with you, Ilian, um, and go to the US. We just talked about the US a little bit and the Fed, you talked about it in your opening comments and it, um, you have a lot to say on this topic. So the Fed raised rates last week by a rare half point, but uh, is it too far behind in the curve? You seem to indicate it was. Can you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts? Well, I don't know where to begin because you know this is just <laughs> to me this is completely incomprehensible. Uh, you know when we start with the rhetoric uh, last year of Jay Powell that the inflation is transitory, you know this was just so laughable because uh, everybody who studies economics should know that every inflation starts as transitory, unless you're in Venezuela or Argentina and you just start a hyperinflation or Zimbabwe. But otherwise, inflation starts as transitory and can remain transitory if the Fed responds on time or the central bank responds. When the Fed is accommodating, I mean, this is what happens. Let's say inflation starts because of oil prices. So oil prices or supply chains, it doesn't matter what it is. They go up by 3%, 5%. Then if monetary policy just stays and provides liquidity as much as it is needed, People say, you know what, I'm spending much more on oil, as Vivi was pointing out, but I need now to spend also on other things. Let me get a loan or let me, you know, the interest rates are zero. You know, I can get a really cheap loan and I can continue my spending habits. So money supply increases and now the inflation, the prices become permanent. And the moment inflation increases and becomes permanent, 
people start asking for higher wages because I can tell it in Seattle now everybody says, you, know, you can't increase my wage by 2% because inflation is 5%. So now the wages increase and when wages increase, we have to increase prices. So it becomes a wage price spiral. I cannot believe when I look at the data, <laughs> I was just looking at the balance sheet of the Fed. Last year, relative to May 2021, the Fed's balance sheet already getting an inflation signal. They increased their balance sheet by $1.1 trillion, which is just ridiculous. And you know, Jay Powell in March said, oh, you know, there are soft landings when uh, interest rates, you know, actually increase, but you know, there was no recession and everything was really nice and inflation went down. If you look at these episodes, if you look at the history of the United States in the last 60 years since the Second World War, you realize one thing, interest rates, inflation does go down. And sometimes inflation goes down even when interest rates stay stable or even in interest rates go down. But the real interest rate, and this is the main point I've been saying for I don't know how many months now, the real interest rate, which is in nominal rate minus inflation, has always been positive in these cases. You know, if you look at the 60s, or if you look at the 80s, if you look in the 90s, always positive. It is the first time that we, we see in the US minus six, 7% um, uh, real interest rates. And again, in nominally, in real interest rate being negative, you must be really stupid to actually keep your money or you put your money in a deposit. The best thing to do is go and buy things. And if you go and buy things, that generates inflation. And then with higher inflation, people buy more things because it's better to get the 8% return by avoiding inflation rather than, yeah. And uh, again, I can go on. Uh, last year, actually in April, when inflation increased by 3.3% relative to a year before, they were using this excuse, oh, you know, the year before it was COVID and, you know, the price level was low. So now we just, you know, return to more normal prices. At that time, if they had started signaling that they will tighten and started tightening, we'll be in a very different situation. Now it's, uh, you know, again, if you look at the interest rates, this is the mistake that Arthur Burns made in the 1970s. Anybody who has studied you know, US monetary history knows that Arthur Burns was raising interest rates, but he was raising them behind inflation. And then he had to be fired and replaced by Paul Volcker and you know the rest of the story. So okay, let, let me stop here because I think it will finish. <laughs> so <I'm> just... <laughs> Jason, I want to move to you. And sure. uh, what? why is it so hard to do both? Tame inflation and prevent the economy. Can you catch us up a bit on the, well, on the logic there? Um, and it's in the simplest way to think about it is that uh, higher interest rates squeeze spending in an economy. And the more you squeeze spending, the more likely you are to tip into recession. That's the, the, the absolutely simplest way to think about it. And it is more or less, you know, pretty accurate. Um, the uh, and then yeah the big question is uh, can you squeeze spending at a rate that is you know somehow matches these two objectives um, and Ilian mentioned Volcker earlier we've had lots of episodes uh, in the global economy and in the US economy where uh, ringing inflation out of the system when it has become as trenched as it probably has uh, had to, had to lead to recession. Um, I have no idea if they can engineer a soft landing. Um, we look at things like the labor market in the US, it's still going gangbusters, right? I mean, it's uh, consumer spending is still doing really well in the first quarter as well. Um, there's the strange sort of um, uh, uh, contraction, but uh, all the sort of domestic indicators were doing fine. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, if you want to, it, it does seem a very tricky a balancing act, a tricky thing to pull off, and I don't know if they can do it at all. Okay, so that, that's more uncertainty and perilousness there. But Lily, I want to ask you from the standpoint of investors. So we have a whole generation of investors who may never have seen interest rates go up like this. So when they manage their portfolios, what should they be thinking about that they may not have had to think about before? Oh, I think you're on mute. That, that's a really interesting question. You know, um, you probably all saw yesterday, you know, the market was 
you know, very, very nerve, you know, uh, nerve wracking. And there seems to be no place to hide. I think in the short run, there's going to be lots of portfolio managers recommending people to go into, say, cash, you know, because yesterday everything is going down, growth stocks, value stocks, commodities, oil, everything. And but like Ilian pointed out, if you hold cash in the long term in the, in the inflationary environment, that is counterproductive in terms of, you know, uh, preserving, preserving and grow your wealth. So I think that, you know, it makes sense once the immediate volatility of the market quiets down a little bit, you need to think about allocating, you know, the cash. Right now, I think it's good to place to hide, but you need to think about allocating that into something that grows in the long run. So, I mean, for young people, you know, always it's um, equities is for the long run. If you have that horizon, if you don't need the money, you know, you need to think about things that grow. So even though in very recent market conditions, the tech stocks, the growth stocks have been really sad, slammed and their valuation have become actually a lot more attractive. In the long run, these are the firms who are still gonna deliver the growth in my view. And also the way that they are gonna be charging you know, their clients in terms of uh, you know, SaaS companies, you know, these kind of uh, software and, and these technology companies is gonna go up with inflation. So in a sense, it's kind of like a natural inflation hedge. So I think that it, it, you know, if you are wanting to venture back into the stock market, then uh, you know, growth sort of names are still uh, to be considered. In fact, I think that it's a good play because these things are going to grow with the inflationary environment. Um, and also real kind of physical asset, but I think everybody knows this. People have been buying real estate and things like that, and the prices are going through the roof in the U.S. as well. Uh, so I also think that it's really important, especially for young people, to also think about their own human capital. So essentially, you know, invest in giving yourself the right skills and giving yourself the right capabilities to be competitive in the labor market. So those are the things that, you know, I would say in terms of what people should put their resources into. So don't all turn to cash. Seems to be the message from you. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the impact of higher interest rates. Um, this is a question from the audience. What What is the impact on Southeast Asia? Maybe, Ilian, you could talk about Singapore. Um, so historically, when the Fed raises rates, usually emerging markets suffer a lot. So the rest of the region here will be probably suffering. Uh, currencies will be depreciating. and uh, Some of them might have financial crisis. Again, historically in 1980, when Paul Volcker raised interest rates uh, that nearly to 20%, the federal funds rate, which today is at 1% at the time was 20%. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, in the, we had the, the Latin American debt crisis. You know, several countries in Latin America went bankrupt. In the 90s, when uh, Greenspan started raising interest rates, we had the Mexican peso crisis, and towards the end of the 80s, the Asian crisis. And it just, and, and then they engineered their own crisis in the 2000s with the, uh, with the raising of the interest rates. So I think that countries outside of Singapore uh, will probably have difficulties. It depends how far the Fed will go. But again, I, I don't know what will happen in the future. Nobody knows. But I know what has happened in the past. And what has happened in the past that at no point in time in the history of the United States, inflation has gone down by itself. Persistent inflation has gone down by itself with nominal rate below the inflation rate. It's so take your conclusion out of this with the inflation rate at 8% if it stays there where interest rate should be. Now, Singapore it has a bit of a conundrum because the way that Singapore conducts monetary policy is different. So they use actually the exchange rate because most of the goods here in Singapore are imported. So in order to reduce inflation, they appreciate their currency. So the Singapore dollar is expected to appreciate against a basket of currency. So there, there are, I don't know, four or five uh, currencies in that basket. But I call it the audience remembers their finance class or macroeconomics class where if interest rates and the exchange rate are linked. So if you have a currency that becomes more and more valuable, then the interest rate in this country has to be below the interest rate in the foreign country. So actually interest rates in Singapore have to go down in order to avoid arbitrage. Otherwise, if I have the same interest rate as in the United States and appreciating currency, I have free lunch. 
So um, you know, interest rates here will go down. That will actually fuel, you know, probably asset prices and so on. So I don't know exactly how aggressive they will be, but if they become serious in fighting the inflation rate here, if the inflation spreads, which it will eventually, into Singapore, well, it's already here. Then, um, then it will be an interesting dilemma between interest rates versus the exchange rate control of inflation. So that's that's not a trivial problem that they need to solve. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another audience question, Jason. I'll go to you on Europe. So, what will if the Fed is slow in raising interest rates? What about the ECB then? Well. Um... All the signals from the ECB are that it is going to follow the Fed down this path of tightening. I think um, it is increasingly obvious, though, that Europe is in a much weaker possession, position even than the US, uh, particularly on the growth side. So if we're, you know, I'm sure the word stagflation will pop up somewhere in this uh, conversation at some point. And I think if you had to look around the world and say, well, that looks most likely, then that's probably the place you would point to. Um, I think the Bank of England last week uh, even may even have used the word stagnation to cheer, and it's certainly expecting very high inflation. Um, in terms of higher interest rates, we had it wasn't that long ago we were having debt crises in Europe. Uh, no, I don't think the banks are in the, in the same poor health that they were then, but you still have countries like Spain and Italy where rising interest rates mean higher mortgage payments for people, much slower consumer spending in response, all this kind of stuff. Um, the risk of bad debts piling up again at banks' balance sheets. Um, and all this is happening when, as we were talking about earlier, China is slowing. That's good to hurt Germany. So I don't think it's great for Europe is the short answer. And um, I think the ECB... I'd interest to know what Ilian thinks, because I think the, 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 the trade-off for growth and inflation in the US uh, in terms of Fed policy, in terms of central bank policy, is maybe a little different, at least if you speak to some people in, um, in Europe, where perhaps the, if you might want to err more on the side of supporting growth. Ilian, what do you think? I mean, usually the European Central Bank has been much more hawkish about inflation. So they have been always very strict about the inflation rate. They have a mandate. They don't have this uh, very, you know, what should I call it, very opaque or very unclear uh, mandate, which the Fed has you know, to support growth and price stability at the same time or employment and price stability at the same time, which, again, we know that usually there's a trade-off between these two things. Uh, it's uh, called the Phillips curve. And, uh, you know, it's uh, in, in, in Europe, you have inflation. So I... At the same time, Europe has one, it's not a benefit, but it sounds a bit like a benefit that the labor market is not as tight as in the US. What we see in the US, you know, we have now 11.5 million job openings, which is not only historical high for the US economy, but it's like usually double, triple the normal levels of job openings in the US. So the, the, the job market there is just crazy. So the wage price spiral in the US is much more, I think, at, uh, ready to be launched. It has started already compared to, to Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I actually now, Jason, you mentioned stagflation. So I wanted to stay with Ilian and ask him about this. It's a question from the audience. How likely is it that we will reach stagflation, and could you explain it as well? I I think that it is it is quite possible. I would not rule it out, um, it's especially if we end up with um, you know with the with the Fed going uh, going slowly, because uh, again, when you look historically. Uh, stagflation in the U.S. started happening when inflation increased and then stayed for some time, and then unemployment started increasing. And uh, I, I would not say that it is not possible. It is possible to avoid um, maybe the stagflation, but not the recession if they raise interest rates very fast. Mm -hmm. So if they try to kill inflation right away, inflation can stop. I mean, again, not quickly, but relatively fast. And then by the time unemployment starts increasing, you may not see the two things together. But that means a very deep recession. 
Yumiko, I just want to add one sort of uh, piece of uh, uh, thought here, which is that, you know, the uh, wage um, price spiral in the U.S. is looking like, you know, what's kind of going on. But part of that very low unemployment rate and also, you know, high growth of the wage is because actually the labor participation rate has been a lot lower compared to, you know, pre-pandemic time. So that that's, I mean, the cause is many, you know, in terms of generous kind of pandemic uh, sort of support and things like that. Lots of people are on the sidelines. So I think that one kind of escape hatch or kind of things is like more people draw, are drawn out and to rejoin the job market. So that will in, in, in turn uh, um, be better in, or it, as more people enter the job market again. That will be dampening mm -hmm. sort of the wage pressure. And right, right. Okay. Okay, so a lot going on here, but we want to now move on to the war in Ukraine. Another, you know, thing that's going on right now that has uh, huge implications on the global economy. Uh, I want to start with you, Jason, on what the impact of the war in Ukraine is on developing economies, since this is also a question from the audience. Um, yes, I mean, I think the most direct effect of the war on Ukraine on developing economies is the increase in commodity prices and the increase in food prices that have flowed from the invasion um, and indeed the Western sanctions in response. Um, I think for developing economies, if we mean, uh, you know, if we, the big problem for developing economies is presumably going to be food and energy. Mm -hmm. um, we are already seeing a bit of an inflation problem in India, we are seeing much more severe problems in Sri Lanka, of course, um, and possibly also in Pakistan. I think, I think all these problems just intensify whatever the underlying weaknesses of some of developing economies are. Um, and of course, uh, you know, food and fuel have a long and unhappy history of causing political problems in developing economies. I think in a lot, I, I mean, I think in most places we're not quite there yet, um, but I, you know, occasionally you hear really quite gloomy forecasts that we're a couple of bad harvests away from something pretty severe. So for developing economies, I think those are the big problems, food, fuel, um, and, you know, trying to keep people happy under such circumstances. So again, it leads to inflation of, you know, with the uh, commodity prices going up. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. And inflation, of course, for um, someone on low income is, you know, more problematic because your spending goes on things that you can't live without, right? So food in particular in, in developing countries is one of the big problems. Okay. And what about uh, Ilion? I want to ask you about China and in, in all of this. So publicly, China's been close to Russia, but it seems when you look at what the Chinese companies are doing, you know, what, what do you think um, or what is your takeaway on China in all of this? Actually, I think that uh, I have a slightly different view than many people out there about this China-Russia relationship. Okay. And it's, to me, it's very scary. It's not necessarily economics, but uh, it's more political science. You know, in, um, so here, 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 here are my thoughts. In, if you look at China, where China, you know, invests, in developing countries or in other regions. Actually, my, my daughter wrote now a senior thesis on Chinese investing in Eastern Europe. Okay. And what is shocking is that China created 10 years ago a plan called, or a project called 17 plus one. So 17 East European countries plus China. You look at these 17 countries and interestingly, you know, they have the Baltics, they have, you know, a lot of countries there. But they're missing Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova, which to me clearly signals that there is an agreement. This belongs to Russia. The, the rest, we'll see how what we can do there. The level of investment from the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, and also FDI, the level of investment highly correlates with the lack of governance institutions in these countries. So there are only 17 countries but the biggest investment is in countries like Serbia, Hungary, and the lowest one in Lithuania. Why are the Chinese doing this? 
Well, if you listen to Vucic, the president of Serbia, he's extremely positive about China. He's has actually he says, you know, Taiwan, it's not our issue, it's their issue. You know, they, we should not be intervening. Hong Kong, they crack down, he supported this. The Uyghurs and all these issues, you know, they basically use this in order to buy support for their policies. Lithuania, on the other hand, which is the other extreme, has been very critical on all these issues. So here is to me the biggest worry <laughs> for the future of the world, it's not economic. It's like in 1992, Francis Fukuyama published the book, The End of History, where he argued that, you know, the West has won, liberal ideologies have won, you know, we don't have to worry about anything about, there'll be events, we'll recall these events, but that's not history. History is the clash of ideologies and that's gone. Well, I think it, we see the rebirth of history. I think that Russia and China, Russia with the military force, China with the investments and other forms, basically they create a way in order to promote the non-liberal autocratic regimes uh, as, as a way to, to succeed. Imagine this, imagine that China is the only country in the world with, you know, single party, communist party in rule with not very, you know, transparent elections and so on, then it will be a lot of pressure from the rest of the world and people inside China will say, well, others live differently and so on. And there'll be a lot of pressure to change. But if a lot of the countries are supporting and say, look, you know, China is growing so fast and they're doing so well, this is a much better model than what we have in the Western world. To me, it's a big clash between the anti-liberal countries and uh, the rest of the world. One of my colleagues, uh, political scientist Michael Witt at the alumni forum in New York a month ago, actually created a map, which to me was quite, uh, I think at the wake up call. The map, he, he colored the countries himself, blue supporting the West, red supporting Russia and China. And when you look at this map, and that's his guess, you know, will Brazil go this way or that way? Will Serbia go this way or that way? Will India go which way? When you look at this map, I think it is really, really scary. And I think for the last, let's say 20 years or so, the West has lost the plot that it's a clash of ideologies. Okay, so it all leads to whether or not globalization is in trouble, it sounds like. Um, and we will uh, next turn to Jason on this question. There are a lot of questions from the audience on this, um, you know, with Ukraine, Russia, what Ilion has talked about more longer term and um, what does this all mean about in the longer term, are we going to have a more deglobalized world or yeah. is it just, I also, I also think there's a term called slowbalization. Slowbalization. <laughs> yeah. Um, I find this one, a diff I find this a difficult question to, to, to get my head around um, for a couple of reasons. One is if you look at the, uh, I, and I tend to think of it most in terms of China and the US, this sort of decoupling question, which my editors are constantly asking about, for instance, but it's actually quite, I find it quite, it's quite hard to see deglobalization in economic data in trade flows, in foreign direct investment flows, all these things are still pretty much holding up as far as I can see. Um, you know, that sort of economic globalization is definitely under strain, I think, particularly around supply chains, particularly around um, uh, the growing interest in the corporate world of having some sort of redundancy in your supply chains and so that you're not just um, completely, um, you know, completely in trouble whenever China shuts down a big port or whenever it shuts down a factory. Um, so there's that, and I, so I find it hard to see in the um, economic data, but the geopolitical stuff that uh, Ileana is describing is much clearer, right? And there are lots of other instances where you can see deglobalization. You're not seeing Chinese students going to American universities. You're not seeing, you're seeing Chinese academics, Chinese American academics come under scrutiny at American universities, all this kind of stuff. There are lots of different ways it does appear to be playing out. A better framework for me for thinking about it is a kind of balkanization of the world economy where 
things are sort of, you know, things are still connected, but increasingly there are these big spheres of influence centered around China and Asia, the European Union, and then the United States and in the Western Hemisphere. You know, quite how far it goes, I really, I, I find it very difficult to say. I, and I still, as I said, to go back to what I said at the beginning, it's hard to really get a sense that things are um, deglobalizing in any really significant way in economic data, but you can definitely see it in, in, in politics and there's no clear way back to uh, the, the pre-existing world, if you like. Mm, um, I think we also, also had some quite uh, stories, Jason, about even though even if companies try to not have such a globalized supply chain because of all the disruptions right now and try to make more things in their own countries, that's not that easy to do. You can't just pick up and and leave the countries that you know it, the the network is so intricate right now. That's right. Um, I think that's especially true in many ways of China. There aren't many places with that scale, right? If you want to open a factory and employ 20,000 people or whatever it is, there aren't many places in the world that you can do that um, quickly and, uh, and so on and with the big supply chains around it um, as China. What I mentioned the word redundancy earlier, you do hear that is a real sort of buzzword and C-suites and that kind of thing where you might uh, um, move particular parts of your operation back to um, the United States. Somewhere like Vietnam is really benefiting from, you know, the movement of the real low end manufacturing stuff out of China and into a more disparate um, supply chain in Southeast Asia. Um, but then you also hear of, who was it recently? Volkswagen, I think, um, I think came out and said pretty surprisingly and explicitly that they want to just sell a lot more cars in America <laughs> and have kind of given up at other parts of the world uh, for exactly for all these reasons they just want stability mm, okay and with more decoupling Lily I want to go to you next uh, what's happening to the dominance of the US dollar is it threatened and this is also is a question from the audience mm. I actually in my view I think the US dollar might even be strengthened you know because of mm. This. And because if you look at all the fiat currencies that could challenge the US dollar, I mean, Euro, Eurozone economy is fairly weak. And, uh, you know, overall, the fundamentals in a worse shape compared to the US. And China, for many reasons, I mean, they have been for the last 20 years, I think that the West countries are waking up a little late in terms of China building influence through, you know, kind of investing the Belt Road Initiative and the 17 plus one in Europe as well as trying to globalize, you know, kind of pushing the influence of renminbi. And they, I think what's happened recently is going to actually make people kind of, you know, uh, retreat from that. And, and the other thing is that, you know, you might have things like cryptocurrencies uh, potentially, you know, being, you know, a challenger to the US dollar. But I think that that still is a relatively small uh, force. There are some countries that might have hyper inflationary risks, they might want to go into say Bitcoin or something like that. But in fact, you know, even just the recent movement, the huge run of US dollar against Euro against yen actually is seeing that a lot of the times, you know, when the world is in the turmoil, people still see US actually is a haven, US dollar is as a haven. And actually kind of coming back to your earlier question about the deglobalization, lots of people worried about it. And we, we've been talking about this for maybe five years, you know, kind of deglobalizing and, and, and since, well, maybe, you know, two or three since COVID, it looks like a pretty dark thing, like we're reversing the um, development in the last 20 years and uh, uh, retrenching uh, the development. But maybe there is a little bit of a silver lining here because maybe that particular version of globalization hasn't really worked very well because actually it's a little bit of a polarization. You know, there's a bit of the East versus West, uh, we're coming back to a little bit of the Cold War, China versus Ch China versus China's rise, you know, kind of versus US and China plus Russia versus the West and so forth. Um, the global economy is very dominated by these top three. Um, and I think that to the extent that people are going to try to decouple a little bit from China moving supply chain, it doesn't take, it's not overnight. It's not going to be like that, but maybe some of these capabilities are going to leave, you know, kind of China and leave to go to other countries like Vietnam and, and maybe other Southeast Asian countries or even Africa. Um, and hopefully maybe we're going to be on the path to search for a different kind of globalization. Maybe you would have a more multilateral 
a type of arrangement rather than just everything is dominated by China. China is the factory for the whole entire world. And uh, I think that that's maybe uh, a little bit excessive. And, you know, China produces everything, sometimes, you know, very cheap, but poor quality. And there's, there's issues with that. So I'm hoping that, you know, like Churchill had said, you know, you don't, never want to let a good crisis go to waste. Maybe we are in a little bit of a global crisis in many different ways, but hopefully out of this, there's going to be something better that, uh, you know, could emerge, maybe spread that capability a little bit more different uh, countries get a chance to develop. Wow, I was just going to say, this has been a pretty gloomy uh, discussion that we've been having here, you know, with uh, things going bad and worse and about to continue. And Lily, um, you just had said hope. And I want to turn to that a little bit. Uh, um, and again, this is, you know, there are many, many questions on this, but are there any upsides at all to this? Because it seems so gloomy. Is there any way to avoid the most gloomy outlooks that we've been talking about? Or are there any countries, and maybe Ilian, I would turn to you next, and are there any countries or industries that are making use of the current situation as an opportunity? Well, uh, I think that Singapore is definitely one of the countries that uh, is uh, a good place for um, for actually for supply chain stability. A lot of companies are thinking, you know, maybe more expensive here, but at the same time, you know, that for certain things, you, know, you can't build the same factories as you have in China. Um, you know, you have the stability here, you have the predictability. Uh, it, so there are, of course, other countries that are benefiting from this, but to me, you know, in the long run, you know, globalization, there, there is this chapter in um, Yuval Harari's book, uh, you know, in Sapiens, you know, the arrow of history. And the arrow of history is pointing in one direction when you think about this in the grand scheme of things. And there will be deviations, you know, the great, the great Depression led to tariffs and all kinds of trade wars and everything. But, you know, since 1970s, the world has been opening up. So, I think that globalization will continue. I just don't think that that uh, to, and to me that's the optimistic part. I think that uh, to me, at the end of the day, uh, we have to distinguish between a broken machine, broken engine that cannot be repaired, versus you know some slowdown or some problems on the road that you can actually overcome. Inflation is something that is you know, will be overcome one way or another. There's nothing wrong with the ability of people to create companies to produce. There is a huge potential in developing countries in China, in India, in the Middle East, in, the, in Africa, all around the world, you know, to, to continue growing. Uh, there is a possibility. And that's, you know, we'll have probably a couple of difficult years. We already had a couple of very difficult years. Um, I, but you know, I, it's very difficult for me to see how miraculously this will change, and uh, without going through some pain. But the long run is is good. I think that again, the world has a huge potential to continue growing. Okay. Um, you just mentioned India, so there's been a few questions from the audience on India. What is India's role in, in all of this? Is this question for me? Yes, the, it's for, I'm saying with you, Ilya. I, I think that uh, India has uh, an amazing potential to continue growing and to grow at six, seven, eight, nine percent The big issue in India is to make sure that the government removes all the you know, the, the bureaucratic obstacles for growth. Because we know we know a few things in economics. Some of these things we know with certainty. And some of these things we know, we kind of like know. And of course, some of the, these things we think that we know, but we don't. But one of the things that we're certain of is that if you have impediments for people to create businesses, to trade, if you have governance institutions like rule of law or corruption and all, then it doesn't work. You know, you can continue growing for a few years and then you stop. Argentina in the beginning of the 20th century was the richest, one, one of the richest countries in the world among the top 10. 
and grew very rapidly until the 1960s and then reached the middle income trap of the wall, as I call it, and then stagnated there and has been there for 50 years. So India has an enormous place to, uh, you know, from an economic point of view. From a political point of view, it's much more difficult to predict. It's one of these countries that my colleague Michael Witt painted as uh, uh, kind of like a shade between red and blue. So we don't know where they will side with uh, Russia and China or whether they'll side with the West. Uh, I mean, uh, at least I'm not an expert on India, but that's what my political science colleague was saying. So from an economic point of view, it's a huge potential, of course. Okay, so uh, we are running out of time. So I want to wrap up with one, you know, it, it just to summarize what we've been talking about, um, as we said in the very beginning, there are so many uncertainties going on, you know, the never before, I can't imagine, never in 20 years, never in 40 years. Um, it's that kind of, kind of place right now. It doesn't, from what you all have said, it looks like the uncertainties, as Ilya and you have just mentioned, that it's going to continue, the uncertainties, the, the, uh, uh, the turbulence that we have been experiencing. Um, for if we are to talk about some things to look for, Lily, it sounds like you were saying that um, perhaps there's a new kind of globalization that might take place, uh, including uh, you also mentioned cryptocurrencies. And Jason, it sounds like what you know it, it's still uncertain what will happen, but there could be some sort of a new, you don't think the globalization will stop, or this is not the end of globalization. And Ilian, it sounds like you are, I couldn't quite tell if you were, you had some optimistic views or it was mainly negative. So I want to end with you on just one final thought uh, um, about, you know, what should we all be on the lookout for in the future? Should we, are there any bright spots ahead or is it more turbulence no i think it, i think as i said i think in the long run there are a lot of bright spots again it's uh, we always when we when i draw charts of growth and gdp there are always two lines there's the potential growth and then there is the current gdp and the current gdp I, I it's difficult for me to imagine how we can go and reduce inflation from this rate without having a bit of a you know problems along the way Mm -hmm. In the long run, I'm very optimistic. I mean, I, I don't know. I, nobody can time the market, but, you know, it, <laughs> the question you asked Lily about investors, you know, in the long run, we know that, you know, things will be, will be fine. You know, the governments uh, are in the U.S., in Europe, and uh, hopefully around the world are going to do the right policies eventually, mm -hmm. and then you return back to potential. So you have the growth and, yeah. So maybe the message is to, to keep optimistic, look out for, for um, the positive signs, as, um, as everybody said. Well, I want to, uh, we're coming to an end here, so I really want to thank uh, the panelists for an insightful and very exciting discussion. I want to thank all of you in the audience for uh, participating today, and uh, it looks like we will have some um, more seminars coming up, so please stay connected. And thank you very much.